to LOA Today. I'm Walt Thiessen. I've been doing this podcast since September of 2012, and boy, are my lips tired. This is your Daily Dose of Happy. We are so happy you decided to join us today. Not sure if we're going to get a visit from Alex today. I have a feeling we're not. Uh, obviously, we know that she's been dealing with a lot of stuff. So, Alex, if you aren't able to make it, we'll miss you. But we'll see you again in the next week or two. And I'm pretty sure Dan's over in the Middle East right now and has been for a while. So we're, we're not going to see him for a couple months. Um, uh, Logan is my guest today. Logan Shippey. And Logan, he, he's like a world traveler. He, he is everywhere. He, he's kind of like, um, what's that, that little cartoon character that you find everywhere, right? He's, he's like a cartoon character. <laughs> One of those. He, yeah, he's one of those. He just, I mean, he is like a world traveler and an amazing, amazing person. But, uh, that's all right. We'll, we'll have to save introducing him to you on another day. Today, we're going to get to know you, Logan Shippey. First of all, I got to compliment you on your last name. For the business that you were in, you have absolutely the perfect, perfect <laughs> last name. Yeah. Because you're in the e-commerce business and what happens in e-commerce? There's shipping that goes on. Mm-hmm. So. Logan Shippy, I love the name. That's fabulous. Yeah, when, it was funny. That? It's funny actually. Like when uh, this was probably about mm, a year ago, because I've been involved in the e-commerce space like seven years. But uh-huh. from like a social media perspective, and like you know, doing our automation service where we scale stores for investors, sure. um, really putting it out there on social media, showing people what we do, stores that we manage, performance, all that. People started thinking that my name was an alias. <laughs> oh, that can't, that can't be real. <laughs> like, yeah, a bunch of people asked me that. They said, Hey, is, is that your real last name? And it started happening all at once. Like it was, it was random. No one said anything. And then all, all of a sudden it was like a year into social media content. People go, is that your real last name? Yeah. At first I was like, what do you mean? And then it dawned on me exactly what you said, Shippy. I'm right. like, Oh, well, actually, you know, that it, I guess I'm meant to be where I'm at is Apparently. what it comes down to. Yeah. Yeah. There's a certain degree of destiny going on here and that's appropriate. That's good. So tell us. Now that we know that there's some destiny involved, tell us how you actually got involved in this. This is an interesting field mm-hmm. to be in. Stumbled into it backwards, uh, for really? sure. And that, that's like everything that I've ever done is not because I necessarily had this dead set, like, uh, I want to do e-commerce. Mm. Cause you know, for me growing up, I grew up in a very entrepreneurial family. Mom and dad mm-hmm. run their own landscape construction business. Aunts and uncles do the same. Mm-hmm. Grandpa ran a multi-million dollar vitamin business. So just business ownership and entrepreneurship was instilled in me since I was born. You know, right, like, it right. just seemed normal and, um, got involved in entrepreneurship when I was about like six, probably about 16 years old, started actually producing engineering music, turned that into a part-time gig while I was working in restaurants. And then that turned into a full-time thing where I didn't have to work in restaurants. I just produced engineered music, learned a lot about like the creativity of sound. Yeah. And looking back at it now, that was really helpful for me to transition into marketing because once you understand how to manipulate sound on like these different programs, such as Pro Tools or Logic, a lot of the same type of um, UI UX interface is the same way on Final Cut and editing videos and whatnot. And like, I just became very familiar with that. And so when I, when I got more so fascinated with marketing and sales and affiliate marketing, I was like, okay, I know how to work. Um, like the music type programs, let me take a stab at marketing with uh, visuals instead of just sound. And it was this just kind of like destined, you know, progression to work from sound into visual and then uh, put the two together. And I started, I mean, from my first year doing affiliate marketing, learning how to drive traffic online and sell digital goods, uh, went from making like probably 30, 40 grand a year with music being like 18 years old. Then at 20, 21, getting involved in affiliate marketing, going and basically almost 10 Xing my income in a wow. single year. And, um, you know, I, I stuck and stayed in the affiliate marketing world for a while, multiple years. And then I had a couple friends that got involved with drop shipping on eBay and eventually Amazon and then other marketplaces over time. And it really fascinated me because it's like, okay, well, you're not necessarily having to be good at sales. You're not. You're not having to, um, you're not having to talk to the end customer and tell them why they should buy this product. These people are just going on these marketplaces and buying things like toilet paper or, you know, kitchen items or, or whatever they're buying online on a day to day basis. And that chart, you can go look at the stock market. You can go look at crypto. You can go look at real estate. Like a lot of it's going up to the right, but then it's also, it's tanking right now. Mm-hmm. You get tech stocks down 80, 90%, whatever. They've had a rally recently. But when you look at the e-commerce chart, the amount of users that keep on like uh gravitating towards these platforms 
on a, a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis, that chart just keeps on going up and to the right. And so I recognize a trend that things have gone from brick and mortar to click and order. I want to take advantage of that. I had a few friends that had built out their own operations for like sourcing and hiring and training employees. Um, and they wanted to bring me on as the guy that was more so the forward face. Like, mm. Hey, if, if we're going to, if we're going to offer this as a service to bring on investors and manage their stores for them, because we've done it so successfully in house, we could kind of duplicate the process and just use the, the capital from investors. But the guys that I work with were not good at, um, marketing. Ah, yes. So it's like, okay, well, we need a, the charismatic guy. That's the face that <laughs> can make this thing look cool. And, uh, you know, it is cool. It's like, it's just, you can generate true passive income online with e-commerce if you understand how to automate things correctly, which is what we do mm -hmm. by sourcing and hiring and training employees and designating them to do product research and list products and process orders and all that stuff. But, uh, yeah, I came into e-commerce, like learned the ins and outs, saw a bunch of different operations from drop shipping to FBA to private label, all the different ways you can make money with e-commerce because there are certain strategies where you can, um, with drop shipping, you can technically find a supplier, list a product at a high price. It sells at a high price. Then you go use your credit card to purchase that same product at a low price and send it to the end customer. So technically mm -hmm. you're selling high and then buying low and then mm -hmm. just being the middleman between the transaction. Mm -hmm. Whereas with FBA or private label, you're, you're buying low and then selling high, but with right. buying low and selling high, you have risk exposure because what if the product doesn't sell right. after you've bought it? So we've come up with this hybrid model to where we're implementing both drop shipping with approved suppliers and then doing private label where we actually build products from scratch. But again, getting into that, it was like stumbled into it backwards, was in affiliate marketing, the online space. And then I have just met so many cool people in that world. Um, and then eventually, you know, some of my close buddies started crushing with e-commerce and then they brought me in. And I learned quickly, like, I don't want to be the guy that's doing the product research and listing products because that's it's time consuming. Yes. So I can understand why we have a very attractive offer to investors because, you know, people with money tend to be busy and people yeah. with money want to make more money. And, right. You know, if you're making a hundred grand a year, okay, you'll be 10 times cooler making a million dollars a year, right? <laughs> like, don't be afraid of money. Money provides you freedom. So for us with what we do, again, it's very attractive. Um, and I know this firsthand because like I've, I've, I see what goes into running these stores. And there's no way that like one person can run an e-commerce store at scale. You need to have outsourced, you need to have outsourced teams to be able to do this. So an example would be like, you have a couple guys that are just designated to product research, a couple mm -hmm. guys that are just designated guys, girls, whatever, to listing products and processing orders as they come in. You need to have a team assembled. So that way, you know, you as the business owner, you're not wearing all the hats. Just like if you're right. in a restaurant, you're not going to be at the, the front table checking people in. And also be the server, also be the chef. You'll Same thing goes with this. That way. Exactly. Yeah. So stumbled into e-commerce kind of backwards and by accident. But the main, the common denominator of why I ended up in there is because I was already in the online space. Yeah. And I had the connections. And it sounds like good connections too. Oh yeah. Now, Great now I, I can tell already many listeners synapses are snapping as they're trying to keep up with all the acronyms and the terminology yeah. and so forth. So uh, I, I won't try to iron all them out because he threw about 50 terms out there. I'll throw a couple out. UI, UX, user interface, user experience. It's all about mm -hmm. how the person interacts with the website, what all that's like. Um, e-commerce platform, there are different kinds of ways, different, different platforms you can sell your stuff on. Uh, scaling is about building up your business. And we'll get into a bunch of these, but I guess what I'm saying is don't be just completely turned off by all the terminology. We'll, we'll, we'll dumb it down a little bit. I'll try, bit, I'll try to dumb it down a bit. Yeah. 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 If I were to re, if I were to re, retrace a couple of those steps, basically some of these programs that you use, you know, online, like, Let's say you use Facebook and Instagram where the buttons are and everything like that. That's what the UI UX that's is. The UI UX. And so when you're using yep. a program, you know, let's say you're recording, just like how we're report, recording this podcast, there are certain button layouts on the programs to use them. And it's like, okay, well, this program works this way. There's another program that works kind of similar. So if I'm trying to create content and just manipulate the sound and manipulate the visuals, like click at the button, do it this way, do it this way. That's what I was learning at an early stage. Right. And then I, I studied the psychology, man, like understanding sales, um, watching videos, not necessarily even like trying to, uh, like when I see ads, I'm, I'm watching, I appreciate the art of sale. 
You know, I'm, I'm watching the advertisements, like, not necessarily what is he selling, but how is he selling her? How is she selling it? How are they positioning the offer? How are they exaggerating the problem and making a, a crafting the solution to really solve that problem? And so like, that's what I did for, you know, from reading books to studying marketing and advertising and then to the creative side, actually developing content. Um, just, you know, it, it's a progression, a crawl, walk, run thing. And once you understand that, kind of um that that flow and that the the you have the base skills you can take those base skills into into multiple businesses like for me I have the e-commerce business which is great you know like you don't need to be skilled at sales to sell on e-commerce you just have to understand how to build systems mm -hmm. but then I have a software development company where you know we actively build softwares and apps for um influencers and companies etc Mm -hmm. I have a main flagship product that we built in that software development company called True Fans, and that's a platform that helps influencers uh, monetize their content. Okay. So that's that's been amazing, and like we're just about to launch a bunch of ads because because we've got to thousands of users, um, and hundred well thousands of content creators on our platform, but hundreds of thousands of users in total, uh, and it's been like organic in the sense of us not paying for advertising on platforms because. You know, when you're a startup, you got to make sure that you're not just blowing money. You know, we put like probably easy to do, by the way, way easy. We didn't raise any money. We bootstrapped it. We built the technology, everything in house, which I have an amazing development team. That's, you know, like usually one third the cost of us devs, which, you know, we're blessed to have amazing developers. Um, but yeah, you don't want to just like blow through money. So, uh, we, we spent probably about like 50 grand in total to get maybe, maybe 35 to 40 grand in that range to get the product originally launched. The actual SaaS platform, SaaS software as a service. Thank you. Um, dubbing it down. And, uh, yeah, we launched that and then we just went to work like, uh, organically DMing influencers and showing them our platform and booking Calendly calls. No fancy funnel, no fancy website, none of that. And we ended up getting to like, you know, 100, 200, 500 influencers as the revenue started ticking up, like making 10 grand a month, 20 grand a month, 30, 50, 100,000 a month. Then we started investing in like, how do we scale up um, the outreach methodology that we were implementing uh, without necessarily spending money on, on paid ads? So like we hired on VAs and then hooked them up to Instagram accounts to duplicate our efforts of just DMing per day. So that's a very cost effective strategy to reach a lot of people. Cause if you have one VA, a virtual assistant that's in the Philippines and you pay him 200 bucks a month and you tell him, Hey, you have to send out 50 DMS per day, this specific way to this target audience. Then it's like, well, if you have five of those, let's say you had 10 VAs working for you, sending out 50 messages a day, that's 500 messages per day. That's going to your target audience. And you're only spending 10 times 200 bucks a month. That's 2000 bucks a month. You're getting how many messages sent out, you know? So that's, that's the, the scaling of manual outreach is what we've done on true fans. So that's like a system thing, but then the content that they're sending to the influencers to get them interested is the creative content that I've developed that it, you know, it's taken time to build that skill, the marketing and sales background that I have and the creativity, putting it all together. So all, so if you're listening to this and you're thinking, you know, uh, it, it sounds like a lot, but it's, it's just skills that I've acquired over time. And I think that, you know, different people are going to be strong at different things. Like some people are going to be more systems driven. Some people are going to be more creative. Some people can do both. You know, it's, it's rare that you can kind of find both. I'm where it's like hybrid type of people that, yeah. but I also have really solid people to help in the areas that I suck, which I'm like not good with legal docs. I'm not mm -hmm. good with like the contractual, like that's not my forte. Mm -hmm. um, the FAQs, that's like all that stuff is my worst nightmare. So I have really <laughs> solid partners to help in areas where I suck. But yeah, so it's just like when you tie it all together, really I've harnessed the skill of creative content and sales and knowing what type of systems will work. But then I hide, like once I kind of build out the system, then I have the firepower and bringing in like a team of people to help me build the system. So I don't have to be working in it. I can kind of work on it. If that makes sense. Like from oversee it, it as it's happening. 
Yeah, it, it does make sense. And, and it, it makes sense to me anyway. I can't speak for the listeners necessarily. Yeah. I, I'm <laughs> continuing to keep their, their thoughts in mind here because I do have some background with this, but for those who don't have background with it, it can be not only confusing, it can also be intimidating. Oh, for sure. Talk, is. You, you talked about all these different skills that you have. And I'm thinking listeners are saying, well, I don't have those skills. But I didn't have any of those skills 10 years ago. You know, like a decade ago, I was, uh, I mean, I'm 29 now. So like 20, basically at like 18 years old is when I started getting into marketing. And now, you know, everyone's marketing with taking pictures on Instagram and, you know, there, you could build a million dollar business just from, you know, pictures and videos on your phone. Like you really can, you can sell education. You chances are, you know, something, um, you have a particular skill set or knowledge a, about a particular, uh, field and you could monetize that. You know, a lot of people sleep on that. They, they, but and the reason why they sleep on it is because they're intimidated of what, what will people think if I put it out there and it's not, you know, just the fear of failure it is what holds a lot of people back. And for me, I realized well, like fear, fear of failure, but also fear of technology. True. Technology is true. a gigantic fear for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, a lot of the things we're talking about here, almost all we've talked about so far has been technology driven. And that, that scares the pants off of people. I don't care what age they are. We're not just talking the baby boomers, you know, yep. the, the millennials, the, the Gen Z's, there are a lot of them that are intimidated by it too. Mm -hmm. Even though they grew up with it, it's like, no, nah, hey, you know, it's, this is, this is a little bit uh, rough stuff to try to deal yep. with. I, I can handle a, a Facebook account. I can handle an Instagram account. I don't know if I can handle this other stuff. I mean, but look at you, man. You're running a podcast. You're running a, <laughs> a digital show, right? Like, and, and it's, would, would you have ever thought that you were doing this? You know, you've been doing it for what you said, 10, 12 years, somewhere in that range. Um, you know, take it back 20 years. It's like, I'm doing what? I'm running yeah. a podcast. Oh, yeah. I'm interviewing guests from across the world through technology and I'm live streaming it and I'm doing this. So like, you know, when you look at technology, technology seems scary, but it, and it's scary in the sense that it's, there's so many moving pieces to technology, but over time as you, you, it, if, Technology is something that you're interested in. Like for me, I was, I was interested in software. I was interested in building tech because the largest companies in the world are tech. You look at, oh, yeah. um, Amazon, you know, Amazon's yep. e-commerce. It's online. It's, it's a digital, you know, website that's selling physical goods. Right. So it's kind of a mixture between like a, it's not full digital. And that's why a lot of investors, when they, they come work with us, it's like, it makes sense to them because crypto is just too much for them to, to, swallow in a sense it's like crypto and tech. Those, those, those are like those are two that pretty much have yeah. the same weight in a lot of people's minds like yeah i'm staying away from that yeah i'm staying away from that i don't know how to handle those guys i can't even describe like exactly how bitcoin works if it makes anyone feel better and i'm a tech guy you know <laughs> but i understand it's the future because it's like you know when we when you have a transparent financial system um that you know can't really be stopped and it's fair it's it's apolitical like that's what the world needs. It needs that. No, no one can just go in there and print a bunch of Bitcoin. You know, like we need these systems where it, it makes our life better. And there, there are definitely forces that don't want Bitcoin to succeed. But I think that if the world adopted something like Bitcoin, it would be a hell of a lot. We'd have a better world is what it would come down to. There'd probably be less war. Uh, there'd be more freedom, be a lot of amazing things if, if the world embraced Bitcoin. But going back to it, that's, that's tech. If the world embraces tech and if you spent just the same amount of time um, being intrigued and in researching like technology and, and trying to maybe harness a skill around like creating content or whatever. If you spent the same amount of time that you are being fearful and like avoiding it, if you spent that same amount of time diving into it, you'd realize it's not that scary. You'd, you'd actually learn something and you'd probably be uh, passionate about it. Well, I think that's actually true for anything that and you use the correct word, I think that you're passionate about. If you have a passion for something, it's easy to dive into it because you're passionate because, Oh yeah, mm -hmm. I gotta, I gotta know more about this thing. Mm -hmm. I gotta do more. I gotta, I gotta handle more. I gotta, I gotta absorb this stuff. I gotta pick it up and just see what I can do with it. Um, I think the, the, the biggest thing to hold people back is when they're not passionate about something and then they're trying to talk themselves into it. Absolutely. And they say, you know, and, and now all of a sudden they're basically pushing a rock uphill at that point. Because how can you really do something that you really don't love with, you know, throwing yourself into it? You can do it for a time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've interviewed people here on the show who have done that for a time. They burn themselves out, 
they burn themselves to a crisp and then they write a book about how you shouldn't do that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, there's but, seasons, there's, uh, there's seasons of, of growth and like, you know, just because you're doing something now doesn't mean you're going to be doing it five years from now or 10 years from now. True. Yeah. You know, you, you may Trust have, me. you may have a, a, a season of, financial success in a, a particular industry. And then you just, you know what? It's time to move on to something else. Mm. Like you, you don't have to marry an industry just like okay. you don't have to marry an investment. If you're investing in a stock and you're like, you know what? I'm going to take profit on this and roll it into real estate. I'm going to start doing that. Like no, no one is forcing you to, to do well for the most part. I don't know everyone's situation that's listening to this, but like <laughs> you have, you have the ability to spend your time how you want to spend it. And I think that you have to be clear on what you want. If, if you're, you're either in line with what you want with your actions or you're in the way. Exactly. So for me, I wanted freedom. I wanted to be able to do what I want, when I want, with who I want. I wanted to be able, once I had my son, you know, he's three years old now. It's like, that was a major shift too. Like, okay, legacy. Like what, what am I going to hand down to him? I need a business. I can create residual income, like real residual. I need something that if I died tomorrow, that it, it could still run without me mm. and it could, it could be around for the next five, 10, 15 years. Some like, you know, just, and, and it all comes back to the internet for me, which again, some people, it scares them internet. I need to work with my hands, whatever. But even on the internet, you could, you could film a video of you working with your hands and build this a following. And like, yeah. you know, you, so, so there's no excuses when it all comes down to it. Yeah. It's really just another tool. And when you understand it as a tool, that kind of takes a lot of the, the strain out of it, I think. For sure. I think, I think we kind of talk ourselves out of stuff. I, I, you expressed it very nicely the way you said it. Um, but really that's what we do. We talk ourselves out of stuff. Um, the other thought that was occurring to me as you were talking there was you know, your son and mm -hmm. uh, you were talking in terms of the legacy, but also th that's another example of how passions develop. You, you, you mentioned how we don't do the same thing forever. We don't have to do the same thing forever. My dad did that. My dad worked for one company for 44 years. That was his en entire career. But that era is long, long gone. Oh, it's different now. Yeah. It's way different. I was gone. just, I was just telling, cause we just put my son in daycare mm. and, um, I was telling, you know, my wife, I was like, just the whole education system now is, is totally. It, it needs to adapt to what's going on in the world because you, you can go. You can go build a business so easily these days with a, a specialized skill that requires no degree. Mm. Like an example, um, if you understand how to build a funnel, which is a website, you know, let's, let's say a website, but the website is designed to take people to a particular step. And then you understand how to run some ads, paid ads on social media. Like mm -hmm. you understand how to reach a target audience and, and maybe you know a guy that can shoot content and you have a few businesses in your area. So you could put those businesses on a retainer for two grand, five grand, 10 grand a month, depending on the size of the business. Mm -hmm. And with some basic skills, like in even outsourcing, using some people in the Philippines, et cetera, like for really low costs, you could easily go build a 5,000, 10,000 a month net income. And you don't need a co fancy college degree you, and you could work remote, you know, like the world is so much different. These opportunities didn't really exist. Um, right. Even, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Oh yeah. So this, the same, new. because most people, I, I think most people go to school in hopes that they're going to be prepared to, uh, and, and have a status to get hired and have a, well, a high paying job. But, you know, more and more companies are searching for automations. They're searching for softwares to replace people. They're searching for, you know, and it just everything's changing so rapidly. So when I, I just think about all the things that I learned in school that have just no applicable use to me in this yeah. day and age and what I really went through to learn what I know now. And, um, it's no knock on the education system because there are great things that you can learn. And especially if you're going to be like a surgeon or, you know, some really like, I don't want a surgeon working on me who watched YouTube videos. You know, I, I want, I want someone, That's a good point. I, want, yes. I want a surgeon who went to like eight, well, what's 10 the years TV screen school. for there? I'll hold on a second. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> DIY, DIY surgery. Yeah, um, right. but, uh, but yeah, it's just, it's such a different time, man. Like the, the school, the schooling system. And, and I think that, I think that, um, 
if you're if if your real goal is to make money, then you should look at what people are doing to generate money online. And especially if you have kids, if you're listening to this and you have kids, you should be telling them to like find on social media, these guys that are, um, there's just so many things that run through my mind when it comes to making money. There's like e-commerce is an industry credit and funding software and apps. I mean, like there, there are, I, I have at any given time on a month, probably four or five different income, you know, streams coming in. They're mm-hmm. all based around the internet, mm-hmm. but they all serve different purposes. Like we have investors that come into our e-commerce company and, you know, we charge 35 grand, 50 grand for them to come on in. And then we're taking that money and sourcing and hiring and training employees and doing all that and the systems around that. And then we have a credit and funding business to where mm-hmm. we're helping clients secure large lines of credit. And then we have real estate, you know, investments going on. I have my software development business and I have, you know, all of these things lined up, but it's like every year I'm kind of adding an extra thing or finding something that can fit in the flywheel. Cause like, if you have an investor that you work with that it's like, Hey, I want to give you 35 grand to do said service. And then you also have this other thing that's for people with really good credit, AKA getting, getting them funding like 0% interest. Now it's like that investor that gave me 35 grand, they probably want to get an increased credit line too. So now I'm, I'm double dipping. I'm helping an investor run an e-commerce business. I'm helping them get credit lines. I'm maybe if someone doesn't qualify for the credit line, I can pass them over to a credit repair business and work out a relationship with that. You know, then it's like all, all of these internet businesses, a lot of them have overlap is what I've found out over the years. And so if you can figure out a good system to generate lead flow with like content ads, et cetera, like getting, getting the exposure out there. Um, there are so many synergistic businesses that, that, that work together. And I wish I could, I wish I could show you, but there's been so many times where it's like, I have a piece of content out there. I get an interested, you know, investor. I help them get credit. I help them with the e-commerce business. Then it's like, now they're, they're wanting to be my friend forever, you know, cause I've helped them out financially. And right. it's like, what else do you have that I could invest in? And it's mm-hmm. like, Oh, well maybe there's something down the road or whatever, but you know, if you or any one of your, your, you know, if you have kids, you're listening to this, just pay attention to what's going online because there, there are so many different ways that you can make money online these days. You got to, I would say just pick one because it can be overwhelming. Like, well, what do I want to go into? Mm -hmm. Just like pick like, okay, I'm going to learn about e-commerce and learn about it because you have time to figure out if you like it or don't like it and you can pivot into something else. Like I have friends that friggin' they run YouTube channels and they outsource, uh, you know, some of them are running their own YouTube channels and making all the content. And then some of them are outsourcing the content to be made by VAs. Mm-hmm. And they have like faceless channels that are making hundreds of dollars per week that are just, uh, getting paid off the advertising because people advertise on YouTube. So right. these videos, they gain traction and they get paid that way. And it's like, think about that. You're just making content and getting paid. Mm. That's it. You yeah. know, like that's not, that's not that difficult to fathom because people need to advertise on YouTube. YouTube is huge. It's owned by Google. And so again, going back to the, the online side of things, tons of ways to make money online. E-commerce is my backbone. That's, that's where my face is showing people how to really, uh, create more passive income in the e-commerce space. But then there are, you know, other kind of legs to the spider, if you will, uh, that are all internet based streams. Yeah. Well, yeah. Once you dig into this, it's, it's like going down any rabbit hole. Only it's like a mammoth rabbit hole that just has a thousand different paths leading off mm-hmm. of it. A thousand paths. There are tons of different of ways. I'm like, Oh man, I didn't oh. know that that was so powerful. Like yeah. to, to make income that way. You know, there, I, all the time I learn about, you know, different niches that people are crushing it with. And it just, it blows me away. And it's just mm-hmm. these new sectors, new industries are being created. And, uh, it's, it's, it's even tough for someone like me to keep up. So don't feel bad if you feel it's, it's no. tough for anybody to keep up. I mean, I, my background was tech and I could barely keep up with it to be perfectly honest. So yeah, I totally get that. I resonate with that entirely. You know, you, what you guys offer obviously is a great solution for somebody who has some money to invest. They want to do this stuff. They don't want to have to do it themselves. They understand the value of delegating mm-hmm. 
and having a whole team do that for them. And so undoubtedly any listeners who are tuning in who want to do something like that, they're going to probably be reaching out to you. But I'm also thinking about listeners who are at that beginning point. They don't have the funds to do all that kind of thing. You know, they've thought about perhaps trying to do something. They aren't really sure what exactly. Maybe they have an idea. Maybe they don't. Maybe they aren't really sure whether or not their idea would actually gain traction. There are people who wanted to buy whatever their product or service is and so on and so forth. But they, they at least have enough gumption that they want to try to do something. And, mm-hmm. and you said a key phrase, dive in and start doing it. But let's talk about that for a bit. What, what do you do when you want to dive in and, and start something, an X, whatever that X is? Yeah. Be? Well, I'll give you an example. So this was about four months ago. Probably about four, yeah. Um, I had seen one of my friends post that his dad got a bunch of money back with a government program called the ERC funds. ERC stands for employee retention credit. Mm-hmm. I'd never heard about it before. I was like, mm-hmm. hmm, this is new to me. It's like PPP, but except it's not a loan. If a business owner has W2 employees, they can qualify for up to 26 grand per employee. Then my brain starts churning, start doing some research. I see there's some companies providing that as a service and they take a back end fee and they'll like cover the upfront costs for the CPAs. I'm like, Oh, this is brilliant because if a business can with 10 employees times 26 grand that's 260 grand, if they're charging nothing and then take, let's say 15% on the back end, like these are big checks that can get cut. Mm. You know, we're talking upwards of hundred, 200, $500,000 on like one deal that you could net depending on the size of the business. So, um, you know, over the years, I've just collected the right, the right people in my network, like from CPAs to attorneys, et cetera. So like I, I talked to my partner, Tim, that I do all my, my software development with I said, Hey, Tim, um, have you seen this? Do you think it's real? I said, let me talk to a couple CPAs. He verified info. One of our CPAs had done dozens of these already. We're like, mm. why don't you tell us about this? <laughs> you know? And then, uh, I said, okay, well, let's put together a system to help business owners, let, let's basically copy what other companies are doing and provide this as a service um, and try it for like 60 to 90 days and see if we can get some leads to come in and just as like a side hustle type thing. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and so, you know, we got the legal docs created, which wasn't that hard. We looked at a few other companies out there, copied, had our attorney change it with, you know, some different verbiage and whatnot. So it's not the exact same. And then um, we have, you know, attorney escrow, a few, a few other components. And I reached out to a few friends of mine that are like affiliates that I knew would, would like an affiliate would just be someone who, who could be like a sales rep that maybe knows business owners. Mm-hmm. I just reached out to a few people, business owners direct. And then other people that I knew who knew business owners, like, look, I'll give you, you know, 5% commissions. If you can just introduce me to a business owner who may, who has W2 employees and let's see if we can get them qualified. And within 30 days of turning on the system, having some content, quick little funnel, little application page, like nothing crazy, just a, like a one pager website and just having the backend systems ready. We processed like closer to, it was closer to 2 million. It's like $1.7 million in ERC credits. <laughs> so that was something as like a complete side hustle. And then, you know, we're taking like roughly depends on the size of the deal, but usually about 20% is what we'll take on the back end. So you think about that. It's like business owners get some major win. We get a win. Our CPAs get paid. Um, everyone wins in that case, an affiliate. So like that was a, a, a something that it was an idea and I turned it into a profitable cash flow business in less than a month. But I had an unfair advantage in the sense that if you were to compare that to the average person, it would have, first off, they probably wouldn't have the belief that they could do it. Mm-hmm. Second, they didn't have the resources like this. Maybe they have a CPA. Not all CPAs know how to do this. Similar to like filing a federal grant. Mm. It's not this. It's not, you know, usually CPAs work in their box. Right. Like, I know how to do this strategy and this strategy. Well, everybody you know, does. It, yeah. And everyone, everyone does for sure work in their box. Mm-hmm. Some people's boxes are bigger than others though. Yes. <laughs> so like if you went to a, a, a local tax firm, like a brick and mortar place around your area and said, Hey, will you teach me how I, I made $10 million this year and teach me how to, um, shelter my money through a business trust into a family trust <laughs> into a foundation. They're going to be like, you need to uh, get out of here right now. Yeah, Right. You know what Go I mean? Away. <laughs> like versus, you know, if you're working with like Trump's CPA or something, he'd be like, Oh, I know how to do that. Like, mm. You know, bring it over here. Bring me your business. And it's, 
it's just different CPAs, no different things. And so, you know, I had a really a lucky that the, the couple of our CPAs that we had, you know, made connections with over the years knew how to do this. So I just hired them on as contractors. And, you know, it's just like, that's another little just profit center. Like not everything that you do is going to be a huge win. It's not like maybe it's a home run. Like our e-commerce offer has been a huge home run. The software development has been more of like a steady growing business for me that, you know, we're doing it's it, don't get me, don't get it twisted. It, it's a multi-million dollar business per year and it's scaling, but it's not, it's not as profitable as the e-commerce business. So it's like e-commerce hyper profitable. The software is not as profitable, but it's a long-term build out in the future. There's potential to exit that, right? Like you're, you're selling the data you're selling. When I say exit, I mean, sell the company. Mm-hmm. Right. So like how much are tech companies getting sold for? A lot of them have like 20 X, uh, uh, multiples, meaning that you could sell the company for like 20 X what it makes per year, mm-hmm. what it nets per year. So if your company's netting a million dollars a year, imagine selling it for 20 million. Right. You know, and you're just like cash out and you're just done and you have 20 million liquid. That's friggin' fantastic. Mm-hmm. So you, you know, over time, it's like you stack skills, you stack connections. You stack confidence too. And you, because you, you've been in the game a little bit longer, you, you start to recognize like what may or may not be a winner. And even if you're super hyper confident in, in something, it may not work out. You know, I told myself, cause it's like, I'm busy. I have the e-commerce business. I have the software business. It's like, if I can lightly throw mud at the wall and it sticks, I'll put some more bandwidth into it. And when I saw that, like 1.7 million in credits we filed, I was like, geez. There's legs on this business model. Mm. We could go, you know, if I have a dozen more affiliates or let's say 50 affiliates, a hundred affiliates out there that are smiling and dialing and cold calling businesses or like going to meetings and meeting like, you know, whatever they're, they're door knocking or however they're doing it, getting a lead. This is very duplicatable and it's very lucrative. So, um, you know, that's one of those things where now, and then I use social media to, uh, Lightly. I mean, I put up probably like five or six posts on social media and just did it the right way. They got some good views. Like one of the videos got like 50,000 views and I had like 50, probably, yeah, probably around like 30 to 50 people in that range hit me up saying, Hey, I want to be an affiliate for your company because I positioned it right. And then it was like off that one piece of content, I had like 30 to 50 people hit me up, say, Hey, I want to be an affiliate. And what happens is, is when they generate a lead, that lead gets passed directly to one of my CPAs and my CPA does all the work. I'm not the one doing the work. I'm, I, maybe I have one call with the business owner just to kind of like pre-qualify them. But then from there on out, they're working with the CPA. And then I just like send them a contract when it's time to actually, you know, move the deal forward. So it's a very minimum from the time to energy to money ratio. That's a business that kicks ass. Now, how long is that going to be around? Maybe two to three years for that government program. But you know, it's, it's kind of like a cash grab, but while the getting's good, you get after it, you know, <clears throat> just like anything in real estate. You think that the, the price of real estate's always going to be up? No. But you know, when, when rates are low, the houses are moving. So you yeah. take advantage of those opportunities when they present themselves. So like for me, I'm an opportunistic type of person when I see something and I have a good gut feeling. I think like sometimes what happens is, is when you see a business model and you have a certain feeling and then you pursue that feeling and you see success, you may get that. I've, I've noticed that like an investor said, Hey, I just got that feeling. And I've had that feeling with a couple of business models. And like when I got that feeling, cause I recognize everything's a feeling when I'm talking to someone, I get a certain feeling when I'm talking to them. When I look at a business model, I get a certain feeling. And when you can trust your intuition, if you're, you're really sensitive on that, you're, you're, you're like in line with your ener- your energetic alignment is there. You'll, you'll start to kind of identify those feelings and create patterns from them. And recognize like, oh, that's the same feeling I got when I looked at this and that was a home run. So that's probably a sign I should at least put some time and energy into figuring out if this could be a winner. And, you know, just the rest you'll, you'll figure out along the way. But coming from someone like me, I'm, I'm, I don't have a degree in finance. I don't, I'm not a tax professional, nothing, but I'm helping business owners get a lot in funding. And it's like, I'm the California surfer kid that just <laughs> sees business models and understands how to put people in position. 
So, well, you're also you're also the kind of interview I like to have because you literally in in, in the course of all the things that you say, you give me like a hundred different directions I can go with my next question, and you make it just so easy. Like you oh got to choose God. one. It's like it's you like being a kid in the candy store. Which way am I going to go here? It's wonderful. I'm going to go in the direction of uh, of a very basic point that I brought up a lot here on the show because I think you're a great example of it, and that is, in, in my view, there are there are, are abstractly speaking, there are two fundamental things that make it possible to determine whether or not someone is going to be successful in any way in their lives. And this actually comes out of uh, positive psychology research. So this is actually Mm -hmm. research-based. One is how confident are you? How much do you love yourself? How do you care about yourself? What's your level of self-esteem? You know, how, how do you see yourself in the world among other people, all that kind of stuff. The second is directly related. And that is how connected are you? What's your level of social connectedness? Because mm. those, those two factors, in fact, the sec, the second one that there's a, I've said this many times, but there's a study that was done by Sean Aker, one of the leading spokesmen of the positive psychology movement. He, he, uh, went to Harvard University and he later worked at Harvard in their positive psychology department and did, he did a study where he was trying to identify what would make a Harvard student succeed mm-hmm. in, in whatever they were doing in life. And he thought it was particularly important because of how much stress Harvard students have. So, you know, I could see the, the motivation behind the, the study. Well, he did this long study, all these questions. He was investigating everything from, you know, what their family ties were, where they came from, what their economics were, you know, how do they spend their day? Did they study in the study hall? Did they go to, you know, meet with the, the professors? You know, how did, did they join study groups? What, what was he, he asked all these, these questions. He couldn't find any correlation. There was nothing in there that would explain to him whether or not or predict accurately for him whether that person was going to be successful later on because he would track it later on and find th- th- there's no correlation except for one. One question, and it was the one he threw in at the last second. <laughs> the one question that answered it for him with like a 70% accuracy was how socially connected were they? Because it turns out the degree of social connectedness you have, first of all, becomes the basis for how do you get through the hard times because you have people that you can talk to. And second of all, how socially connected you are indicates how social you are. So how well you're able to connect with other people. And those connections, connections lead to connections, which lead to connections. It's the old mm-hmm. concept of networking. Today we do inter- networking through the internet, but it's still, it's still a variation of networking. It's the same thing. And the networking is, is all about how you connect and why you connect and who you connect to and, and what you learn from them and so on and so forth. Your story is just full of connections. Yeah. I mean, one connection. Yeah, but the, the connections, the, the, so the connections, right? Like I'll give you, I'll give you a really good example of at the, the type of connections that I have and how they were established and like yeah, the meaningful good. ones versus the non meaningful ones. So, um, when I was in affiliate marketing, this was, you know, probably when I was about 22 years old. My buddy, Michael, who I got connected to just completely randomly, and we started making some money online together. Hmm. And he was like, hey, I know this guy, Manny, down in San Diego. We should go meet with him. I think that like maybe he could help us you know, get to that next level in business, whatever. Mm -hmm. And I go meet with Manny, and like we were two alphas, you know, like (laughs) uh, we're trying to like, how do we work together? But at the same time, like, like business relationship at the time wasn't right, but like friendship was. Hmm. So, um, just stayed friends and like we had, we had one investment that we're going to do together and it like completely failed, Hmm. completely failed. And then I ended up like taking the hit for him in a sense. Cause like I had brought the situation to his attention, like brought the deal to the table and he never forgot that. Like he, he said, Logan is a real friend. Like he took the bullet for me Mm -hmm. on that. And then Manny leveled up, like I'm talking about, you know, he, so he's my partner at e-commerce. So he was one of the guys that like just absolutely crushed out of the park in the beginning with Amazon and everything else. And then, you know, he had reached out to me and said, Hey, I want to bring you on as like the face of the company and to help us with client acquisition. You're great with high ticket and dealing with investors and making sure that everything can run great on the front end. Let me handle the back end. And, you know, we, we've had that friendship on and off. Like whenever I go down to San Diego, I'd always meet up with them and stuff. And I completely had forgot that this, uh, you know, bad investment took place, but like he remembered <laughs> it and he brought it up, you know, like 
Hey, that's one of those things where I, I was willing to have you on board because I trusted you outside of just money. Like it was, mm-hmm. it was you were real to me far before, like I really was making millions a year type yeah. of, type of deal. Right. Um, so that's an example of just like from, from tacos to millions of dollars, right? Meeting at a taco shop to making millions of dollars years later. Um, my business partner, Tim, give me one second. I got my son opening the door. Yeah, sure. No problem. So we always love it. We always love yeah. it whenever the kids uh, photobomb on, on the program. Oh yeah. Just, it just shows the reality of it. It's wonderful. Yeah. And then, uh, and then so back when I was in affiliate marketing too, um, uh, probably about 20, 22, 23, around the same area. Um, I got a Facebook message from this guy, Tim and Tim was in Kuwait and he had seen some of my marketing online and he's like, Hey, I'm really just curious on what you do. Your marketing is incredible. Like who are your mentors? I just, I, I want to like meet you as a person. And he ended up, uh, coming out to California and, and we met in person and he was doing private contracting work in Kuwait at the time. And then like it was about probably six months, a year later, whatever, like we stayed in contact and he came out to California. We met in person and we really just drive and he was pitching me on software. Like, Hey, mm-hmm. have you ever thought about getting involved in software? You can create the marketing. We could create a tool, do this, that, the other. And, um, you know, he's now, he, he was the one that originally brought the idea of true fans to my attention. Hey, hmm. have you ever thought about building a platform that could help influencers monetize your content? I was hmm. like, ding, that's, that's something that could be a, a billion dollar company. So, um, you know, we found developers together. He more so handled like, um, the technical stuff with, kind of the liaison between like him and I would come up with the ideas and then he would figure out the way to articulate them to the developers. Cause they, these guys are like cyborgs. These developers, they're, they don't speak human. They speak code. They're difficult to deal <laughs> this with. This is true. Especially it's you add like a very Indian, left brain technology. It really is. You, you add an Indian accent to the mix and some time zone differences <laughs> yeah. and stuff and it, and it becomes very difficult. <laughs> oh, so, yes. you know, and, and he, uh, he's done an incredible job of being like more a project manager, more mm. technical. And like, mm-hmm. I'd focus on the creative side and it just worked out great. So it's like, one of my business partners, we met at a taco shop. One of my business partners, we met on Facebook and he was in Kuwait, you know, mm. doing private content. And it's like years later, fast forward, both of those businesses have done millions of dollars. And it's mm-hmm. like those, just those two connections were like, but those were the, those were the, the real meaningful connections. But then there's sub connections. It's like all of the different th- people that, you know, then put money into the businesses because of the powerful connection that was originally sparked on the, the, with the people who matter. So an example would be like, you know, with Manny, that, that spark of a connection happened, mm-hmm. the business model was created. And then it's like, okay, I go to work and create content. Now an investor comes in and, you know, let's say they goes 35 grand or whatever. And it's like money flows into the company. And then that just happens over and over again. But it was from that original spark of a relationship with Manny. Same thing goes on the software, original spark of the relationship with Tim. And it's like, Keep your, your, you don't need a lot of people. How'd I put this? You don't, for, for me, like I keep my circle very small of like people I really spend time with or talk to on a daily basis. It's like, I don't add many new friends to my life. Like really, I, I haven't added probably any new friends that I talk with consistently on a weekly basis in multiple years. You know, like I have Tim, I have Manny. I have my parents. I have like a couple of close friends that I still stay in contact with from California. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, we have our employees and stuff that we connect with on a day to day basis, but like they're not on the same level of, uh, you know, contact. you don't talk about, you don't, yeah, yeah, you don't talk about the same shit that you talk to your friends. Like, right. You know what right. I mean? You know, you, you can be tr- transparent and real. And like, if something's not going well, you're not going to tell your employees, Hey, this isn't going well. Like you're, you know, so it's, it's, it's just the circle, the circle really hasn't grown all that much. Um, well, it doesn't really need to. I think that's what the whole point of the social yeah. mechanism thing is that once, once you develop a social network to s- stage X, whatever X is, you, you got what you need. Yeah. And as long as it's serving you in all the ways you need to be served, you're right. You don't need to build it out. The reason that you built out the network is because you need some service. Mm-hmm. And there are different people that like, I just keep completely compartmentalized too when it comes mm-hmm. to, uh, different aspects of my life. Like I do a lot of crypto investing, mm-hmm. but like 
I ha- and I have a subset of my degenerate friends that are just like all crypto and that's what they eat, breathe, live, die for. Mm-hmm. And it's like, we don't, we don't need to go meet up in person or anything. We can just talk smack in a chat and like everyone's doing their own research and stuff. And like, there have been some amazing invest- investments that have come through just a simple group chat. But these guys, these guys that I deal with are like, finance majors or like uh wealth managers at JP Morgan like a lot of these guys are mm-hmm. are are very savvy. Yeah. A lot of them have made millions of dollars in traditional business or outside in crypto etc. It's mm-hmm. like we just have a degenerate chat. When I say DJ this is like people that are just like willing to kind of gamble but like really what we are is like modern day VCs but in crypto, like a VC venture capitalist because mm-hmm. that's what you're doing with a lot of these crypto projects. Oh like yeah. They're, if they're sub, uh, let's say a hundred million dollar market cap project, they're not like a multi billion or trillion dollar market cap like Apple or whatever. It's like you're, you're gambling, but if you can find the really good technology in those unicorns at an early stage, I mean, like we had one project that we invested in that did like a 50 X in, in, on capital. That's like, that's hard to fathom. That means if you turned one, if you had a thousand dollars invested, you would have made $50,000. Like, yeah. but in, and it's, it's, just crazy because that it, it goes back to technology, right? Which we were originally talking about is like the, the crypto is technology, but then you also have technology of the phone and like group chats and people being able to do research. And, and like, mm-hmm. really there's no excuse why I'll, I'll take this even one, one step kind of like back. So it would be from a logistics or like, um, sequence standpoint of what you should do. It's like connect with people because that's what you're saying, like your connectedness. So I've connected with people. Like one of my buddies, Omar from high school, he was the one that like really got me into crypto. Oh, okay. Just so happens that he's a multi, multi millionaire now and he Mm. knows a ton. So like his connections bridge me into a lot of really savvy people in crypto. But -hmm. it's like that there's a connection that I made that I retained since high school. That just so happened to be, you know, like very successful in the cryptocurrency market. I just yeah. happened, like you, you go back to making connections. If you're afraid to make connections, you don't deserve to make money. You don't. Uh, boy, you really don't. Tough, it's, a, it's a tough real world reality yeah. right there, but, but it's a good one. It's a yeah. good one. If you're not willing to make connections with people, you're missing out on what they know. And not only what they know, but what the people that they know know. So like, mm. you know, and, and, and they may get uh, just, and <laughs> it's so crazy to think that because like these, these, uh, companies or business models, et cetera, like a lot of them didn't come from me directly, you know, like I'm, I'm almost just because I have a, a good, um, net out there as far, as far as like, I'm, it's like, I, I have a big net. I'm able to capture a lot of fish. I have big network right. that captures a lot of fish dollars through, being aware and have my finger on the pulse and seeing what's hot and what's not and catching a narrative before the, the general public catches a narrative because like mm-hmm. what people are plugged into, like especially in like the crypto world, if you're like really neck deep into the crypto space, like you see narratives before the public. And if you see that a narrative, something that's like, mo- like DeFi, what the fuck? What was DeFi? <laughs> Decentralized finance? Like that all of a sudden, all the, all the projects that were in DeFi, exploded in price, but people that were really plugged in the more degenerate type people like that (laughs) live and breathe on Twitter. And like, you know, they they do that. It's like they caught on to something and they turned a little bit of money into a ton of money, Mm. you know, but the biggest problem I see with investing is like people not taking profit. And I'm, I'm guilty of that to an extent. What do you mean by that? Taking profit is like, let's say that, you know, you're up a hundred percent on a trade. Okay. You invest in something. It's up a hundred percent, 200%, 300. I just had a trade that went up 350%. I took profit, took it all out. I was like, it's a bear market, meaning that things are going down in general. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I made 350%. I'd be an idiot to not take profit on this. Mm -hmm. You know, and I was talking to my buddy. I'm like, it could go up five X, 10 X. And he's like, well, would you be mad at yourself if it went to zero? I was like, yeah. It's like, would you be mad at yourself for getting a 350% gain? I said, no. So then what are you waiting for? Take out, take it all out. <laughs> that's good logic. I like and that. And I yeah. was like, you know what? You're right. And that's coming from a guy, you know, that's been in those positions, right? Well, that, that raises another interesting question. Maybe the last one before we uh, get some info from you about how mm-hmm. to reach out yeah, to you. For sure. But you mentioned the word mentor before. Uh, who, who are your mentors? Tell us about you know, what you look for in a mentor. Mm, 
So I told you like, um, that I, I just study a lot of marketing materials and, mm. uh, that, that for a long time was just no like in-person mentors, but just studying how people moved that were, mm. that were making more money than me in, right. in the online space and whatnot, seeing how they operated. And then I would say like a, a men, cause a lot of my friends are, are, like I'm a mentor in some ways to them and they're a mentor to me. Oh, okay. Like my friend Manny, like I, I, you know, I, uh, he, he, he taught, he, he's been very influential to me for telling me how the world really is versus how my view is on it. Cause everyone, depending on your, depending on your upbringing, you're going to have a different view of the world. Like he was an mm-hmm. orphan who grew mm-hmm. up in New York. His dad left him when he was like five years old in a room. And his mm-hmm. dad was a train killer. Navy seal, Navy seal, like just left him. And he had to like fend for his own through like the whole foster system and everything. Wow. Yeah. And he had a completely different upbringing. And he's, you know, done extremely well for himself mm-hmm. better than, you know, he made more last year than most people are making the rest of their entire lives without. Yeah. Him. yeah. And it's like, you came against all odds. You came from, and he's super connected. Going back to your connectedness, like he is super, super connected everywhere he goes. He knows someone and like they all love him, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's like your likability index and what you know and who you know and all that. He's at a level 10. Um, but you know, he, he's, he's been real with me. Like one of those things he, he told me with investing, he's like selling to strength. You know, like when, when, when things are pumping, most people get greedy and they want to hold on. It's like, that's the opportune time when you sell, like you sell into strength because that's what the smart people do. That's, that's what the whales are doing. The whales are using, you know, the, the retail, like the average investor. Oh my God, it's going up. They're using them as liquidity to get out of their trade. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? To get Mm -hmm. out. I'm trying to Mm -hmm. use, cause like I pump this to get the, you know, the dummies, oh, well, it's continuing to go up. No, 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 no. It's about to go down as soon as I sell out and you are literally <laughs> buying my bag as I'm leaving. And so just things like that, you know, just, just, I ask him all the time, what do you think about this? What's the angle on this? And he's, because he, he is almost like unplugged from the matrix completely from a financial standpoint. Like he can do what he wants when he wants. He's also, you know, people are like afraid of lawsuits and whatnot. And it's like, when you get big enough in business, getting sued is like a normal thing, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and there's been so many times what, like when you hear from the media, for example, uh, like, Oh, Trump didn't pay his taxes. You know, he needs to do this. He needs like, well, who's his, who's the tax guy that like structured it in a way that made that okay. And I'm not endorsing his behavior or whatever. Like I'm not, this is not about, this is just strictly about like media matrix people plugged into, Versus the reality and taking advantage of the rules and not necessarily breaking laws. Mm-hmm. I, you know, he educated me on Trump basically like building all these buildings and then like not paying the, the people or whatever, and then like taking the yeah. court and settling at a very fraction of the cost. And it's like, that was perfectly legal because you're going through the legal system. It's like, damn, I didn't know that. And you know, when you have a big enough legal team and whatnot, it's like you become an invisible mountain. People mm-hmm. think all the time, Oh, I'll t- take them to court. Well, you know, you're going to lose so much money in the, the legal system. And if you have a good legal team, like no one can really touch you for, for to an extent. And I'm not saying that to endorse any bad behavior or whatever it is, but like when you're in bigger business and you're dealing with millions of dollars and whatnot, you know, the world is savage. Like this fit, what he's kind of instilled in me is more so the realization of like the thin veil of civilization. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In the sense that, you know, rich people don't for the most part have punishment. They might get like financial crimes, which is like a fee, but they pay off the fee. It's like rules for thee and not for me. Yes. And you need to do whatever you can do to get as much money as possible, like as ethically as possible. But usually like the people that make the most amount of money in the world are like also not doing things by the, but they're playing Very in often. gray areas. You know what I mean? Very often. Um, so it's like having a moral compass, but realizing the the world for as it is not for what it's portrayed as through the media but like really seeing through it and understanding what are the angles and what are the motives at scale like looking at a global scale and the world is more just being honest the world is more corrupt and kind of scary than i think it's ever been from a perspective of 
people rolling over so easily, you know, mm. like we've just given up so many freedoms in the past couple years. And like during times of crisis, there is opportunity. Like I was telling you about the ERC funds, like sure. that's a program that was launched after this crisis came. So it's like through crisis, now another opportunity. Most people don't know about it. Most people are going to do anything about it. They're going to go complain about the crisis that just took place. Not me. I'm looking for opportunities. And like there, you know, another thing that he taught me is like, there's always an opportunity. There's always a bull run somewhere. Like we mm. may be in a bear, bearish market, whatever, but there's a, there's a bull market somewhere. Mm. Like if you're in the pandemic, what's selling really well? Masks. It's like, yeah, how yeah. do I get into that manufacturing? It, there, there's always going to be something that's, that's pumping or doing well in times of crisis. And, um, you know, just being, being a bit more savage is, is just things that I've, I've learned specifically from him. But then I have, you know, my other buddies who keep me in line that are more like, uh, just very, very about family. Like my business partner, mm -hmm. Tim, he's like, I'm mm -hmm. rich, bro. He's not nearly as rich as my other business partner, mate. Not nearly as rich. <laughs> he's rich in the sense that he appreciates his wife. He appreciates his kids. I would he, say it's a, that's a better kind of rich in a some A different ways. type of rich, you know, it's yeah. totally different. And so like, I get a very good balance between it's like ping pong. Like I get, mm. I'm like hanging out with him. I'm like a little bit more savage with me. I'm a little bit like more, uh, empathetic when I'm around Tim and I have, and, and it's just great having those types of different personalities around you mm -hmm. because like if, if I'm seeing something, I'm not going to go to Tim and ask like if I see something crazy on the news or like, um, you know, something that's really, I just feel like there's an angle behind it. Who am I mm -hmm. going to? I'm going to my buddy, Manny. Hey, what do you think? is about to happen. Like, why are, why is the media positioning it this way? He's mm. going to see right through it. Everything oh, okay. that, that dude tells me is like a see through. Oh, here's the real play. Here's what's mm. going on. It's chess. It's mental warfare. It's chess with him. Like that's how he thinks. And that's, it's just spot on all the time. When I think, Hey man, like if I got in an argument with this person or whatever, how do you think I should handle this situation? I asked my buddy, Tim, you know, it's like, these are mentors in different ways in my life. And then you have like, you're, you know, reading books, et cetera. Like, but from a friend, my friends are all mentors to me. Everyone in my circle is a, a superior to me in some way, shape or form. And I try to take notes and listen to them. Um, and it's, it's panned out pretty well so far. That's fabulous. Th this is one of those interviews where you, the hour is up and you say, well, can I have another one, please? <laughs> but, <laughs> but unfortunately we can't do that right now. Before we let you go, we got to get some info from you. Now you mentioned you have a couple of different programs. Some mm -hmm. people listening might be interested in those. So tell us about the programs first. Yeah. So the e-commerce automation business that we have is called e-intelligence. Um, you can go to e-intelligenceautomation.com. Uh, I'll send you over the links if you want to like add yeah, we'll it put them in the, the show notes. notes. Perfect. I'll, I'll yeah. send it over to you. And then our, our main, uh, for, for true fans, you can go to truefans.com, uh, true fans with a Z, true fans. And, um, that's about it. You know, we like from a forward facing perspective, most people see my face attached to the e-commerce business. Um, you don't really see me too much with the, the true fans business because that's, that's not, it's not me who's, who's driving the force there. It's the thousands of content creators mm. who, who use true fans that generate the income on that platform. Right. So it's kind of like, I'm almost, I'm almost in like the payment processing business for content. <laughs> that's you know? not like too bad business to be in. I'll tell you. I, I call it like the PayPal of content. You know, they make money off transactions. There you go. Same here. But yeah, if that. you're, if you're an investor with capital, you should definitely check out um, our intelligence website and you'll be able to see case studies of people that we work with, how our business model works. You know, it's, it's, it's a phenomenal business model, um, for people with capital that want to make that money work for them, but don't necessarily want to learn any technical skills or devote a lot of time. You know, you can literally just basically hire us on to be the operations team. Just like in, in, if you had real estate, you have a, a property management company. Right. Imagine us being like a digital property management company here to, do all day to day operations on your store, scale it up, manage the orders. Everything is done for you. And we're just leveraging your capital to be able to create, you know, a, a profit split between us. So that's how that works. Um, but yeah, hopefully you're, you're, hopefully all of you guys listening in, you, you got some, uh, some value and maybe some motivation to just get off your butt and do what you know you, you, you should be doing. You, we well, all well, got those I think, ideas. I think everybody's going to take yeah. a different thing away from it. Everybody's going to have For something sure. that it's their own particular angle and they heard one thing or two or perhaps with you five things that they actually liked and said, yeah, I got to take that on board. That's great. So Logan Shippy, first of all, thank you so much for joining me on the program, sharing your, your, 
in-depth knowledge. Really, really very impressive, all the things that you've done. Um, I also want to tell you something that I've been making it a practice to do lately because I think it's important. On behalf of all the people who you will never see, you'll never hear, who you have influenced, whom you've helped, given some information to you, maybe you said something that gave them a little bit of a kick and said, yeah, okay, I got to go do something. On behalf of those people that you'll never see, I want to thank you. Thank mm. you for all that you're doing. Thank you for, for the help that you give to people that, yeah, you'll never meet them, but you touch their lives. So thank you very much for that. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate that. P- appreciate you saying that because, you know, those are things you don't necessarily think about, but. There are, there are people that reach out to me from time to time, like, dude, I've been following you. You inspire me. You did this. You did that. And it's like, hell yeah. You know, you, you love hearing those, those little, those little stories mean yeah. a lot more from like a, they do. the satisfaction, like it versus a dollar coming into the bank account, a hundred thousand dollars. I'd rather get a, a, a story like that, like a DM where I impacted someone's life. Than seeing you know more money come in on on a day in the business, you know it's like very uh, satisfying, it's, it's very, way very satisfying. way different satisfaction level for sure. Yeah, yeah. All right, so this is great. Well, again, thank you very much. Thank you to our podcast listeners everywhere. We will see you all next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>